check this out. Thank you. Uh, let's call the meeting to order. Uh, we're missing one commissioner, but we'll get going right now. Uh, let's start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner Drew, will you lead us? Joanne, could you do roll call, please? You can't hear. Can you hear? You good? Here. 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 Okay, County Advisory Boards, could you please stand so you can be recognized? Who wants to? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to agenda item number two, voting officer of the year, chief of the Chief of Law Enforcement, Rob Bonamici. Good morning. Is this on? I guess so. Uh, for the record, Rob Bonamici, Chief Game Warden. Uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce the Voting Officer of the Year uh, for Nevada Department of Wildlife. This is Brady Phillips. Uh, he started three years ago, believe it or not, with us. So he hasn't been with us all that long. Uh, and he's done one, one heck of a job to receive this, this award this early in his career. He's the only game warden stationed in, Fal or in Laughlin at this point in time. Uh, and in Laughlin, we have a uh, kind of multiple boats there because that we keep there because during the holidays we send uh, several officers down there uh, for patrol. So he's responsible for taking care of a small fleet of boats, so to speak. Uh, the Fallon office, he keeps that, or Laughlin office, he keeps that uh, running and in tip-top shape for us. Uh, the Colorado River, as everybody knows, is extremely busy. Uh, and I remember the first time I went down there on patrol years and years ago, drive across the bridge between Laughlin and Bullhead City, and you look downstream, and it looks like somebody swatted a beehive. There are jet skis and power boats and tour boats going every which way. Uh, so he deals with a, a high volume of people. Uh, 115 degree temperatures normally in the summer, he patrols in, uh, and wearing body armor. Let me tell you, that's a lot of fun. Uh, he, he also, uh, his supervisor is uh, over 100 miles away, and that's a, so he has very little supervision and does a fantastic job, just a self-motivator, takes the initiative, sees things that need to be handled and, and handles them for us. Uh, 
in addition, what he, he's an instructor, a certified instructor for us for firearms, for taser, and then he's an armor. So he keeps our uh, sidearms functional and all that, and inspects them on a regular basis. Uh, he's, he's done a, a fantastic job. Last year, over 140 citations and a heck of a lot more warnings. Uh, so he, he's very good with the public. We, I can't even remember receiving a citizen's complaint uh, regarding Brady. Uh, this past weekend, to kind of show you uh, an idea of what he deals with, we had two jet skis involved in an accident, a family, three on one jet ski, three on the other, uh, following each other. The front jet ski stopped and the jet ski behind them ran over the top of the jet ski in front, killed an 11 year old girl. And you know, those are the type of things Brady's had to deal with as many of our officers do. He's also uh, <laughs> took it upon himself to become an emergency medical technician. So you can see he is just full of energy, uh, very, a very professional, courteous officer, and somebody we're, we're proud to call a Nevada State Game Warden. So with that, I uh, present this award to Brady Phillips. Voting Law Enforcement Officer of the Year. Be it known that Brady Phillips is hereby awarded the Nevada Voting Law Enforcement Officer of the Year Award in recognition of outstanding public service, unmatched professionalism in marine law enforcement, and personal commitment to ensuring safe and enjoyable recreational voting. Congratulations. I must say, I've seen a few of these awards given out and haven't heard a list as long as that of accomplishments, and uh, to do it in three years, you're, you're doing a great job. I can't thank you enough. Okay, with that, we'll move on to agenda item number three. Uh, we did have some developments this morning in uh, the committee meeting that we're going to have to make some adjustments on the uh, agenda, so uh, any other comments on the agenda? Okay, let's go to uh, public comment. Any public comment on the agenda? Since it is an action item, any public comment on the agenda? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission. Commissioner Drew. I'd make a motion to approve the agenda as written with the exception of item seven, including 7A and 7B, uh, and just have that uh, called back at the discretion of the chair with the attendant calling it back after lunch at your discretion. Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passed unanimous. We'll move on to item four, member items and announcements, uh, correspondence. Uh, I'm gonna start today with a member announcement. Uh, I was sorry to read in the paper uh, last week they had an obituary for uh, former wildlife commissioner uh, Don Cabin. He was a cab member for years, a commissioner for years, and a lot of the things from what Don Sefton does to us to uh, sheep throughout the state, Himalayan snowcocks, a lot of the things that we enjoy in this state are as a direct result to Mr. Cabin's participation in County Advisory Board's commissions and just being a overall good citizen of the state of Nevada. And with his passing, we've lost something we truly have. Uh, myself, Commissioner Drew, uh, we had the opportunity to sit on the uh, TAC committee with him a few years back. And uh, I can remember he was on the commission. I thought, boy, he's getting old. And we've heard him for a long time. It's kind of time for something new. And uh, 
we did get something new, but we lost something. We lost him as a commissioner, and when he came back on the TAC, he was one of the most enjoyable parts of that TAC committee and uh, got to spend some time with him. He was a remarkable man, so I just wanted to recognize his passing and, and say that we will miss him, and, and uh, he did offer a lot to this uh, state when it comes to wildlife. So any other uh, commissioner, Mr. Bliss? on with the red button uh, it's all it's all um anyway we we took the time to uh stop by the the hatchery and um and uh we uh found one of the the employees there and asked him if we could you know take the kids down and show them the fish in the hatchery and stuff and they uh they took us down there and they gave us a tour of the hatchery and from the beginning the one they received the eggs clear to the whole process of when they release the fish and uh, super clean organized uh, facility with uh, guys there that were more than eager to take the time to explain what they do <coughs> and what they uh, for the fish program and uh, my kids loved it they got a new fishing spot we go fish and they all want to go back to the hatchery because that's where all the fish are at um, but uh, if anyone gets an opportunity to stop by some of them places and take the time and look and see what those guys do, um, I was really impressed, and it was a it was a good trip for us. Commissioner Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just real brief here, I just wanted to throw it out there to the cabs. The uh, Elk Damage and Incentive Committee met uh, this week with a teleconference meeting, and we're working on an antlerless elk landowner tag program. And uh, we're going to hold a, uh, another committee meeting on the 28th of October to try and get something put together, a final product to bring before the commission for the December meeting. And it should be in your guys' support material, but I just wanted to make sure you were all aware. And I'll speak again briefly on it tomorrow in case there's other cab members that aren't here today. But thank you. Any other commissioner items? Seeing none, we'll close that agenda item. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item number five, county advisory boards, uh, member items. Anybody have anything you want to bring forward at this point? Uh, this not on, Rec, oh, come on up. Uh, Mike Reese for the uh, Clark County Cab. Um, August 15th, down here we had a, it's touted as a, an evening with Tony Wasley. I want you guys to know that uh, it was a meeting, a presentation that he did come in and, and educate the both hunters and non-hunters. Um, it was open to the public, it was free. It's the second year we've done it and the comments that we've got of that is, is there gonna be another one next year? They found it extremely informative and some of the people that even been around for a lot of years learned things that they didn't really know. Uh, most importantly, what they were most impressed with uh, after the meeting said, well, that's the first time I've been, but." why doesn't Tony have any notes? And he says, he's just been around that long. I mean, you can sit and talk to him. He's passionate enough that he, he said to the group, I'll stay till midnight if we want to. Um, it's people like this that, that we appreciate down here in Clark County that will put that time and effort in to help educate the general public as well as the sportsmen and stuff. So on behalf of the Clark County Cab, we want to thank you for that taking place. Thanks. Thank you. Come on up, Gil. For the record, Gil Yannick, uh, Carson Advisory Board. I want to thank the Nevada Department of Wildlife for their participation this past weekend at the uh, Kids Fishing Derby at Bailey Pond in Carson City. I mean, we had about 300 people, about over 100 kids, gave out over 100 fishing rods. Uh, the department was there, and everybody kind of helped from the Carson Fly Fishing Club and some other participants that came down there. Uh, and from the Carson Cab to help, you know, string the lines for the kids and get everybody out there fishing. And I tell you, there's nothing more heartwarming than see these little kids catching these big fish. I mean, we brought in 2,300 fish from a local fishery, 
and some of them weighed two, three pounds. And when you get some of these on these baby rods and it's bent at a U, you know, it's just really, <coughs> excuse me, exciting for everybody to, that participates and everybody that watches. So again, I just want to say thank you to the department and for their support and participation. Thank you. Any yeah, other county advisory boards? Seeing none, I'll bring it back. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item number six, uh, approval of minutes, uh, commission meeting minutes from the August 2013 commission meeting. Has everybody had time to review those minutes for questions, comments, concerns, changes? Okay, seeing no comments. Any public comment on uh, the minutes from the Fallon meeting? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for a motion. A motion to approve the uh, minutes. I believe they've, uh, we've already gotten comments from all the commissioners with regard to any changes, so I think it's uh, ready to be approved as currently written. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion passed unanimous. Uh, we're gonna skip agenda item 7A and 7B at this point and move on to agenda item number eight, big or cheap management challenges, uh, game division specialist. Yes. Uh, there was a reference to a letter that I sent to you. I'm Trish Swain and uh, the letter uh, was not dated correctly. It should say June 29th, 2013. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Did we all understand what just happened? What's that? That's a reference to error in the minutes. In the minutes? Mm -hmm. That was a reference to error in the minutes. Is that your fault? I couldn't tell you. Do you have a page for that, Ms. Swain? Page 35? Yeah. Okay. We've moved on past that agenda item, Mr. Newton. Can we reopen that agenda item, make the change as noted, and go forward? Yeah, you could just have the maker of the motion incorporate that change, and then if the second agrees, and then I just revote just so it's clear. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so I would uh, modify the uh, motion to approve the minutes uh, by, in, I, I think it's the, Third full paragraph, we're twish, uh, referencing to Trish Swain. There's a reference to a date, July 29, 2013, and I think you indicated it was June 29, 2013. So uh, make the correction from July to June uh, on that uh, section. Do, we, do you know where that is? Do you see it? Who's doing, uh, who on the department is doing that? See where that is? Okay, so I'm modifying my motion to uh, uh, approve the minutes uh, as uh, written with the exception of uh, changing July to June in the uh, third full paragraph on page 35 of the minutes. Yeah, and the second's okay with that. And, I, uh, and I, I'll and i make a, a quick comment about it. I, I just in uh, passing and just kind of by coincidence had a small conversation with Suzanne uh, about it. And um, it's my understanding that there was the both dates or both months were thrown out in the in the uh, audio, um, and so this is a clarification of the date that that Trish had intended, um, and I think Suzanne recognizes that. But but maybe to a bigger issue, and it's not a topic of discussion today. But um, it, I'm not sure of the proper process. I don't know if it's um, desirable to have uh, the public contact Suzanne directly on those all the time. So you know. Um, we're left with how to handle it in this particular case. And I think at some point, 
Uh, I mean, these things do go out, the public does see them, and uh, you know, what's the proper venue for them to correct things that they want, that they feel that need to be corrected as well. Um, I'm not sure that uh, having that direct communication line with Suzanne is the, is the way to do it. Um, but, but for lack of a better way, we, I mean, we probably should clarify how to, how to handle that at some point. Director Walsley, do you have any comments on that? I, I would just assume uh, from my side, if there is questions from the public on the proposed minutes that it come before us and we change it at this meeting instead of one off and through your department because we could, she listens to the audio fairly closely and I, that's my opinion. And do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think that things can be lost in translation. Conversation that occurs uh, with Suzanne isn't necessarily captured on the public record where if an individual uh, wanted to express a desire to see a correction and did so in this venue, it would be captured on the public record and incorporated at that time. I think that's the most efficient and effective way to, to make those changes. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a re-second. I'll call for the vote again. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passed unanimous. Agenda item number eight, Big Orange Sheet Management Challenges, uh, Mike Cox. Give me two minutes. Chairman Rob, I'm Dennis Wilson representing Nevada Bighorns Unlimited. Would you consider taking public comment on number eight while we're waiting for our two minutes? That would be a fantastic idea. And it's an informational item, but if you have public comment on this to fill up a little air time, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. For the record, Dennis Wilson representing Nevada Bighorns Unlimited. <laughs> Nevada Bighorns Unlimited is proud to support to partner with the Department of Wildlife for our mission and your mission, protect and enhance Nevada's wildlife resources. One glowing example of this partnership is the growth of uh, the bighorn sheep herds within the state of Nevada. Thanks to combined effort from the Nevada Department of Wildlife and volunteer effort and all kinds of other effort, Nevada now has over 11,000 bighorn sheep more than any other state in the nation other than Alaska. So once again, we are truly proud and truly thankful uh, for the combined effort to uh, augment and develop our state animal. In keeping with this though, Nevada Bighorns Unlimited realizes that science-based management uh, may result in the consideration of a bighorn U hunt. And so Nevada Bighorns Unlimited would like to present its position statement regarding uh, bighorn potential bighorn U hunts. And I'd like to read this in the record. I believe I sent you a copy uh, electronically yesterday, uh, and I believe you may have a hard copy as well. Consistent with the MBU mission to protect and enhance Nevada's wildlife resources, it is our goal to reestablish bighorn sheep populations in every viable area of suitable habitat. The best science available at the time is to be utilized. Capture and release within Nevada or for export to augment out-of-state herds 
is preferable to killing ewes. So long as suitable habitat is available and risk factors are concluded to be sufficiently low by wildlife professionals. Population densities of bighorn sheep vary tremendously with time as displayed within numerous mountain ranges. For example, the Sheep Range, Mormon Mountains, East Humboldt, and the snowstorms. Our nursery herds of today may require reintroduction and augmentation in the future. It is highly advantageous to develop as many new populations across a wide geographical area as possible. If best science developed by Nevada Department of Wildlife Professionals concludes that the killing of ewes is recommended, an example might be a disease contaminated sheep that exist in high densities, Nevada Bighorns Unlimited will support that recommendation. And this is presented from the Board of Directors of Nevada Bighorns Unlimited. Thank you. Thank you. Before Mike gets started, does anybody else have any comment on this agenda item? I don't want to, we let one go. If anybody else has a comment on this, I'd like you to come forward at this point and then we'll let Mike start with his presentation. Any other comments? Seeing none, you still got a few minutes, Mike? I uh, deeply apologize for the delay. I was going to dazzle you with some arc map um, information on the distribution and, and uh, in, on maps on my computer, but the uh, technology was uh, found, found a, a gap between me and the, the screen. So I'm gonna use as much of the uh, PowerPoint that I've got my material in um, I'll be a little uh, weak on the, on the maps, but uh, hopefully I can explain it to you and you can use your imagination. So today I want to give an overview of the challenges, issues, and hopefully some strategies and solutions to uh, some, some things that we're facing today and into the future with our bighorn sheep management across the state. As uh, Dennis uh, was explaining, we, we have a great partnership with our sportsmen, our land management agencies to restore bighorn and, and we've been um, going full bore. Um, We've been, maybe an analogy, we've been acquiring customers like MAD. That's been our business plan, or in our case, putting sheep on the mountain. And maybe we need to slow down, take a break, and maybe our business plan needs to shift more to retention. Retention of those customers, or in this case, retention of the herds that we've built. Um, and I know slowing down sometimes is not uh, necessarily what uh, our biologists or our sportsmen want to hear, but it, it, may be, it may be the time to do it. Uh, so, yeah, we've, we've come a long ways. 3,000 sheep in the 60s to over 11,000 today of uh, primarily deserts, 9,000-ish 9, deserts. Uh, about 1,800, 1,500 California and the, and the remaining California bighorn. 
part of this 11,000, uh, I was just looking at this uh, this week, 25 herds are 200 animals or greater. Um, a lot of Western states, that they, they, they barely have one population over 200. So we've got 25. And um, as you'll see shortly, it's a good problem to have. And then we also have several of these herds being deserts. They're highly dependent on water developments, limited springs. And we've, we've had some real shortcomings here in the last few years. Uh, the rains come, but the rains come sometimes too late. Uh, just a background to our approach to restoring sheep in relation to the d domestic sheep industry on, on the landscape in Nevada. Really ever since we started, um, we've done our best, although sometimes in the past we've, we've put sheep closer to domestic sheep than, than we should have. But we've tried to keep distance from known domestic sheep allotments, either on BLM or on the forest. And in all these situations, if, if we seem to be a little bit close, we, we've always made it clear uh, verbally or in writing that we're going to hold the operators harmless of uh, any responsibility in case there was a disease event, which uh, I'll, I'll bring up later. That's it's an important part of the program. We, uh, in, the, in the recent few years, throughout the West and, and also here in Nevada, we have documented uh, in the wild, not in a laboratory, not in a pasture, but, but on the mountain, uh, using both biochemistry and DNA methods, the actual transmission of virulent pathogens from domestic sheep and goats to wild sheep. <clears throat> uh, and those two, particular cases in recent times are the Trout Creeks and the Snowstorm Mountains. Throughout time, and uh, I'll show you a map here shortly, and you'll, you'll, I think you'll get it, is this lack of separation is very important. Uh, Nevada is very large, but um, there's, there's still a fair number of domestic sheep permits and trailing routes that exist on the public land. And we've been tracking um, our wild sheep wandering off, and we've been tracking domestic sheep or goats that have been coming close, or if not making contact with our wild sheep. And to date, we've got uh, over 100 events that we've documented. Uh, I'll go over uh, that, that list a little bit later of what what all that constitutes, it's kind of soup to nuts. 25 die-offs and, and over 2,000 bighorn have been lost over time, which maybe some people aren't aware of that. Uh, there is currently no effective treatment once bighorns get these deadly pathogens that their immune system uh, are, are just, is just not equipped to deal with. So westwide, Separation is, is the best management practice that, that we have to use in the foreseeable future. A year and a half ago, myself and my counterpart with Montana Fish, Fish and Wildlife and Parks, Tom Carlson, we put a survey together of all of our partners throughout the West and Canada asking uh, the state wildlife agencies to remember what they did or didn't do when a die-off occurred. We were trying to assess, did anyone have a success? Did anyone try a treatment or a method uh, post-disease that, that would recover a herd, would, would re restore lamb recruitment? And I'm just going to give you a couple of slides from that presentation that was made uh, back in January of, of uh, 12 at the, the Wild Sheep Foundation here in Reno. So we had most of the states respond and in alphabetical order from, uh, from left to right, we've got since 1980, 
the estimated number of bighorns that died during uh, disease events. Um, and you can see Montana uh, is an unfortunate uh, winner of, of the uh, highest number in this unfortunate graph. And we're next. And then Colorado is, is close behind. And uh, so we were just trying to frame up what, what magnitude of, of losses have we all uh, documented o over time. This whole presentation, it, it, it dug into asking the states, what different things did you try? What actions did you attempt to implement soon after, shortly after, some time after uh, that you, know, you knew that there was a, a disease event going on? So you can see all the different categories. Uh, but this, this column basically says it didn't work. It didn't work to recruit, to recover the lamb recruitment, which is the single most um, long-lasting, the gift that keeps on giving, as I say, that occurs on a, on a bighorn sheep disease event, is we, we just cannot get the lamb recruitment to, uh, to return to its pre-disease pre event period. Um, we, at the time, uh, this was right after the, the big 09-2010 series of die-offs that occurred westwide, including our own East Humboldt's and Ruby Mountains. And there were some, some culling activities that occurred both in Washington and, and in Montana. But as you go down through this list, you're going to see that the, the, nothing, nothing sticks out. Nothing uh, is something that we can uh, maybe focus on. Um, even no action. If you just walk away, some herds recovered, some herds didn't. And, and probably a lot of the reasons is no, no die-off is created equal. They're all different. They all have, probably have a different suite of, of pathogens and... Uh, so we're unfortunately faced with not having uh, a great many or if any tools in our toolbox to, if there is a disease event, to uh, reduce it, keep it from spreading. So I'm gonna go over some major challenges that we're facing, we've been facing, we'll continue to face throughout the state. And uh, one is, we do have some habitat carrying capacity limitations. They are primarily with our desert herds and their dependency on, on man-made water developments. Um, we need to manage herds better within the carrying capacity of these water developments and their ability to naturally recharge. We've, we've seen uh, degraded forage conditions in proximity to some of these guzzlers, and this is just gonna further reduce the ability of these herds to sustain themselves. Kind of on the flip side, some of our northern herds um, have limited wa winter range, and so if we're gonna look at trying to develop a, uh, a population objective, we need to focus on what the winter range can support and not necessarily what the summer range can support. We have had herds that have experienced die-offs or we've, we've been sampling uh, pretty, pretty heavily the last three, four years and we know which herds have been exposed to virulent pathogens. Uh, the pathogen that we're primarily focused on today is, is mycoplasma over pneumonia. And uh, when we do detect exposure through DNA, it's, it's telling us that there's a, a good chance we may have an active carrier or shedder of that, of that pathogen. And our own wild sheep pose a risk to adjacent herds. And that's, that's something that uh, we, we've kind of looked the other way. We're hoping, we always cross our fingers that somehow they're gonna pull themselves out of their rut and they're gonna, they're gonna recover, but they, they are what I call a landscape liability. 
uh, because uh, you'll see the connectivity of our herds uh, is, is pretty great. We have herds uh, that are in close proximity to known domestic sheep grazing allotments and trailing routes on public land. Uh, again, uh, pretty high probability of, of transmission in, in the next five or ten years. And as I was just saying, uh, connectivity, it was something that we were striving for 20 years ago to get herds built so that they could swap genes and, and move back and forth and probably that effort uh, is, is allowed increased transmission from herd to herd. So it, it's, uh, it's been a double-edged sword and now the talk in, in the wildlife sheep circles are isolation. Try to, try to keep your herds isolated so if something does happen it'll only happen to them. We're beyond the point of turn, return on that, on that situation. Uh, I think something even uh, more challenging, and we've, we've seen this play out over the last five, six years, are uh, domestic sheep and goat flocks on private land. And I think even though we're over 80% public, we don't have a ton of private. What we do have of private is fairly productive. Um, and one of the challenges is we never know who has what on their back 40, and we don't know what kind of confinement they have of those sheep and goats. Um, at least we know the permittees, we know where they're at, uh, we know the season of use, but private land, it's, it's a wild card. And, and we're pretty confident we've had a couple of our recent die-offs that have probably been from private land, hobby, slash farm flocks. This is something that we cringe. We, we definitely don't want to see this too often, but this, this is what could happen. You know, someone with just a pet goat, and uh, they liberate it in uh, an adjacent bighorn herd. Other challenges. We... Uh, We've been filling in the gaps, as, as most people might say, in the areas where we have low risk, where we have separation from domestics, but we are running out of those gaps in our ability to move bighorns that are growing in numbers, sprinkle them out to other areas, and, and reestablish some herds. We, we are just running out of good, viable uh, release sites. Not that we don't have any today, which we do, but we don't have uh, the numbers that we'd like in relation to the number of herds that are kind of bursting at the seams. We are continuing to provide sheep to Utah. We'll be giving them 50 this, this fall. Uh, I just had a very pleasant call from Arizona a few weeks ago. They, uh, they finally got our message. I mean, I swear we've, we've had paid billboards on our state line saying, if you need sheep, come see us. We'd love to accommodate you. Uh, I think Arizona finally saw the billboard. So they're, they're negotiating and discussing with us of maybe looking at getting some sheep here in the next few years. We don't have any demand for, uh, for giving away California bighorn, though. And some other challenges that aren't as pressing, but uh, i just really mention them briefly especially here in the, in the Las Vegas Valley. Um, we've got some issues with urban sprawl. Uh, we'll always have uh, transportation corridors and energy development that could impact Bighorn. Uh, high density herds on, on uh, limited water sources and highly dependent on, I've already talked about that. Feral horses and burrows continues to, to increase competition and those populations continue to grow unchecked in many of our bighorn herds. We've got a lot of invasives that for a few weeks of the month or a few weeks of the year might provide good forage but long term we need those perennials and those annuals just uh, aren't doing enough for our, our bighorn. And wilderness uh, is a double-edged sword. It uh, definitely prevents 
urban sprawl, but at the same time uh, really ties our hands in, in uh, managing sheep and managing waters for sheep. All right, I um, want to go back and just make sure that everybody knew, everybody knows the blue polygons is, is highly likely where historic bighorn herds existed throughout the state of Nevada um, from one end to the next. This next slide is uh, all the counties in purple are uh, where we have known archaeological evidence. I commissioned a, a zooarchaeologist last year to go through all the published archaeological digs and um, pretty impressive. Uh, Bighorn outnumbers any other ungulate by probably 10 times in these uh, caves and shelters. Uh, having um, Lander County here absent of having an archaeological evidence is probably just because we haven't looked hard with every other county around it. Uh, they certainly uh, had to have had sheep and, and Indians utilizing those sheep herds. And even down here, Esmeralda County uh, and Mineral County, these are remnant herds that have always been there. We've never put those sheep in there. They were there since time began, so obviously the, we've got evidence of, of their existence there. But things have changed since, since the 1860s. This is what we were left with in 1960. Uh, this is the distribution of what we uh, consider to be the remnant herds that were left. And then this is a map of basically today's distribution, the green being desert bighorn distribution, the violet purple being our Rockies, and uh, the orange being our California bighorn distribution. <clears throat> so this, this is the slide um, that I was hoping to show you several different layers in ArcMap today. Uh, this is the, the last one I was able to get off my computer. And the yellow are all the public land allotments for uh, that are authorized for domestic sheep grazing, uh, not only within Nevada, but adjacent to us. So um, you, can, you can see probably why some of these remnant herds were remnant, um, really this line from, from uh, Tonopah North, uh, Tonopah Fallon North, uh, Ely North, uh, Caliani North is, uh, has scattered domestic sheep permits um, and uh, this, this presents some huge challenges, always has. Sometimes in the past, we've, we've, we've tried to release sheep away from these, these allotments, and you can see other times um, we didn't. Uh, for example, the, uh, the South Snake Range, which involves the Great Basin National Park, Probably wasn't the greatest idea to, to put bighorn there. Um, but interesting enough, um, and, and this is, we're going to see this a lot, it's persisted since the 80s. It's never died out. It's never gone anywhere, but it's never died out. We, we probably got down as low as 10 animals, and we might have 25 there today. So something's been going on, because um, that is not the normal population growth of of most of our bighorn sheep that we've released. We've also had herds that have pioneered on their own. And uh, this is something we have we need to take more serious. We've kind of looked the other way. Uh, this is Mount Moses. It probably, uh, well, it didn't probably. We know that we had sheep that dispersed from a Tobin release right here and moved into the Mount Moses, totally surrounded by a domestic sheep allotment. Uh, the Shawavis, many of you know, that was a herd that came from somewhere north and uh, decided to uh, make their home right in the middle of a domestic sheep allotment. Uh, again, they have not been uh, with stellar growth, but they haven't died out either. Uh, I have a, a shot with a buffer 
on that I wasn't able to show you. It's got a 10 mile buffer and a 20 mile buffer. Uh, so, so with your imagination, put a buffer around our herds. Um, and actually what it shows is if you put a 20 mile buffer, well, let me go back and explain. Um, we've been putting collars out on rams over, over the last three, four years, trying to get an idea of the, the, the risk, the probability of risk that we have with wandering young rams. Um, again, an, another slide that I don't have, but I'm going to start at the top of the state. I've got about five examples with satellite collar data. This was a uh, California bighorn ram that we released, collared and released in the Santa Rosas. It, it was uh, part of the, the uh, resident herd. It dispersed 34 miles to Oregon and actually was shot by a big horn hunter in Oregon. Um, probably the most infamous movement without a GPS collar was the four rams that decided to go on a walkabout from the Ruby Mountains and went all the way down the spine of the Rubies, the Buttes, and all the way down to the White Pine Range. That movement was I measured it uh, again last night, 127 miles. Uh, put a buffer of 100 miles on our bighorn herds, and uh, you can imagine what that is. Uh, we've got uh, domestic sheep that have actually moved quite a ways. We've got a ewe and a lamb that was on the Nine Mile Peak area. Uh, it's an allotment just east of the Segura Ranch. They went 54 miles made their way all the way to Palisade Mesa and were found within a, a flock of wild sheep uh, two years ago. We had another ewe that made it all the way from the Raptor 7 Ranch uh, on the East Walker River and went about 32 miles down to, uh, many of you know what the elbow is on the, the East Walker River, right in the heart of our, our bighorn habitat. So. And then uh, my, my last one is uh, we have, uh, we actually satellite collared a ram that's part of a herd we didn't even know about. Uh, they, they pioneered down by Highway 6 um, east of Tonopah. And that ram went uh, over 50 miles to the top of Mount Jefferson. And so when you, when you, when you think about the average movement of these rams, uh, there's, there's stray sheep occurring every year from a handful of, of wool growers. Uh, they can go both ways. Our rams are wandering. You know, on average, probably 20 miles is an average. Yes, they can go to 120. The domestic sheep are moving uh, also. And when you, when you realize that, uh, there, there's probably few herds that that don't have any risk, and lots of herds that have high risk. <coughs> Another slide that I don't have is the private land parcels. We, in fact, uh, I was going to zoom in. This ram that went from the South Monitors right off of Highway 6 all the way to Mount Jefferson, <coughs> he went smack dab, Jack, you'll appreciate this, Commissioner Rob, through Belmont. I haven't had a call from anyone living in Belmont that they saw the ram, but it was, it was smack dab through Belmont. And I'm sure at least one person has a pet goat behind their fence in Belmont. And again, you, you could see that probably anywhere throughout the landscape. People living in valleys throughout Nevada um, have pet this or that, and it's, it, they're all ticking time bombs. And so. The private, again, as I mentioned earlier, the private land is just much of a challenge to us because we don't know many of those situations out there that are causing potential risk to our, to our wild sheep. Uh, here's, here's one uh, down, down south uh, that I put into Google. This was a ram that we marked 
that actually was released into the Meadow Valleys. So this is the Meadow Valleys, Delamars, uh, Cane Springs Wash, Clover Mountains, <clears throat> the Utah line, the Arizona line. So uh, in one month, this, this ram moved over 250 miles, went on a walkabout from the Meadow Valleys, came over to the south end of the Clovers, went over into Utah, went across some flats down into Arizona, crossed through the town of Littlefield. Again, if you've ever been through Littlefield, I'm sure there's plenty of hobby flocks of this or that, um, Ovids, and then uh, made its way back to Nevada. So uh, we, we probably knew this was happening, but until we, with some of this technology, we, we, we weren't documenting it. Uh, just to frame up the, right now I've, I've kind of decided that a 10 mile buffer is, is actually a minimum to, to indicate pulling out those herds that are at risk, the highest risk in our state. And if you look at this, this chart, over half of our herds are within 10 miles and this is just public land allotments. This doesn't include private land, uh, farm flocks that we may or may not know about. So, so over half our herds are within 10 miles, um, and there's a really good chance year in, year out, that we, we probably have rams moving 20 miles. So um, when, I, when I did this chart about three, four years ago, I was, I was actually shocked. Um, I, I thought we had more safe uh, separation, but um, we, we don't. Um, it's water under the bridge. Whatever decisions were made in the past, they, they're in the past. We just have to deal with it today. So I'm going to start transitioning from challenges to solutions, or at least management actions that, that we want to try to consider. Um, I want to go back uh, to some uh, spreadsheets. Any 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 questions so far? of their concern about uh, their proximity to bighorns because I, I think I do remember a commission meeting where there was a discussion and the, the view of that producer was that it wasn't their problem and they didn't believe that there was an is issue with pathogens. So I'm just wondering, um, can, you, can you talk about that to some extent? Well, and I'll, and I'll, I have got some slides that will um, explore that, that question a bit. I can't really speak for people, but I've been in meetings with them. I've talked with them face to face um, with, with the majority of our wool growers in the state. And um, it's a mixed bag of, of uh, thoughts and perceptions you know, they're, they're moving forward with their business, their industry. Um, they're, they're really busy people. Um, but uh, there is, there's been adjacent to us in California and Idaho situations where wool growers have been forced off their, their allotments. Um, and so there's definitely some thoughts that if it can happen in ad adjacent neighboring states, it, it could happen here. Um, long term, we, we have and we continue to have uh, this, this kind of hold harmless agreement. So there's, I think, many wool growers uh, that I've talked to do acknowledge 
that transmission is real. Um, some still do not agree with that decision. Um, some are a bit concerned about what, what we're doing out there on the landscape. Uh, for example, last summer, uh, some of our Western region biologists and I, we met with a couple wool growers uh, to, cons to discuss a potential release in the East Range. And we were going to be placing potentially sheep within 15, 20 miles of domestic sheep, both a public allotment and on uh, some private parcels they have in the valley. And, you know, they, they, were, they were open, but, you know, they were concerned. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we decided not to do it. Uh, it wasn't the right thing to do, and uh, just not enough distance. Uh, after speaking with them about their operation, the timing of the year, they're, where they're at, and so um, some are certainly they don't want the problem any closer to the backyard, so to speak. Um, so here is a spreadsheet of our herds that are within 10 miles of a, of a permitted domestic sheep allotment on either BLM or Forest Service lands in Nevada. Uh, I actually used this in, a, in a, our statewide coordination meeting with the BLM. So it's got what BLM district they're at, what subspecies. I've got the population estimate of, of that herd. And then under these circumstances, uh, I've identified some of these herds are just simply at risk within 10 miles, and some of these herds we already know because we've sampled them that they have mycoplasma, they have some virulent pathogens that they're carrying, or at least they've uh, they've had an immune response to our tests for mycoplasma, indicating that they've they've. Uh, tried to defend that, that pathogen in the past. So if I go all the way down, and this includes all species statewide. Uh, again, I wish I could have showed you this visually. So that is almost 4,000 sheep that are within 10 miles of uh, domestic sheep allotments here in the state of Nevada. And of those 4,000, 750 are what I called earlier landscape liabilities. They, they are living today with some virulent pathogens in their, in their immune system. Many, many of these herds um, are going nowhere because of the limited lamb recruitment. But um, this is a good point to tell you. We, there's still a lot of unknowns. And understanding the pathogens the environmental factors and other issues that come together to cause pneumonia and cause death. We have herds that have mycoplasma and their lamb recruitment is as good as any other herd that doesn't. And so uh, it's not a nice, neat, black and white, cut and dry situation out there. We've got um, other herds that are uh, what I consider, they're, they're far beyond 10 miles from a domestic sheep allotment, but they've been exposed. We've got the Fairview Slate, Sand Springs, Pancake Range, Northern, Northern Pancake, Duckwater Complex, and recently the River Mountains. Uh, just outside of Henderson and Boulder City. Those total 600 sheep, again, uh, based on documentation of mycoplasma being detected in those herds, uh, we could consider them landscape liabilities. All right, um, I want to go back to the PowerPoint. So 
Back in 2007, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies sanctioned the beginning of the Wild Sheep Working Group, and our first business of order was to develop guidelines and recommendations for domestic sheep and goat management in wild sheep habitat. We've since uh, published a popularized version of that, which was done last year. Uh, this is the front cover of that. It has recommendations that we as state agencies and uh, other recommendations that we're asking land management agencies to consider and even the permittees themselves to consider in maintaining separation. Because of some of the heightened awareness, uh, legal political issues that were, I was saying earlier, in Idaho, California, next door, uh, I really felt that we needed to try to rise above all this and develop a sheep separation strategy. So back in 2011, I got the blessing of our director and our staff to try to develop a set of umbrella guidelines, tiered off the WAFA guidelines, and uh, I've I met several times with the BLM in the forest, went to a statewide wool growers meeting and presented the concept of the strategy a couple years ago. And unfortunately today, I can't say that this is in, in place, but we're, we're moving in the right direction. And really boil it down to three main things that, that this strategy uh, is hoping to do. We, we have to build greater trust, and we've got to great, create more open lines of communication with the affected parties. Um, we know we've had permittees see wild sheep, or their herders have seen wild sheep coming toward their band, but they just have been concerned about telling someone in fear they're going to get in trouble, uh, they'll be kicked off their, their allotment, um, and we need to do a better job of of uh, keeping track of those animals. And then also when we do see domestic sheep, we're always struggling to find the owner. Um, and if we had that information already laid out and discussed and game plan agreed to, uh, we, we could deal with these stray animals, regardless of where they're coming from and where they're going. Um, the one thing that, that, that I've been kind of a stickler with and it's, it's something that's not going to change overnight, is when you have 2,000 sheep and one herder, maybe two, three or four dogs, you got brush, you got rocks, you got coyotes, you got lions, you got hikers, you will have those herds split up, blown up, um, and there will inevitably be stray domestic sheep left on the landscape. And it's just, it's been a business practice forever uh, on the landscape. And it's, it's a tough one for us being sheep managers because all it takes is one, all it takes is one to go 50 miles uh, or 10 miles or whatever. And so we haven't quite resolved, you know, how can we decrease the number of domestic sheep that are left to stray in time and space after the permit's over and, and beyond the, the boundary of their, of their allotment. But uh, I do really do feel that, that permittees are willing to try to do a few more things as long as it doesn't hit their pocketbook. Um, they, they, they told me that, but um, it's, it's not going to be perfect out there. But again, we, as long as we can reduce the probability of transmission, then we're, we're doing something better than where we're at now. Uh, before I go on to some of these management actions, uh, there's one more spreadsheet that speaks to <coughs> our herds that are bursting at the seams, um, beginning to reach their carrying capacity. Um, 
this was just a quick and dirty exercise on my part. We do have um, plans to meet statewide with all of our biologists to try to develop some population objectives, which, which we have not done in the past. But my, my knowledge of the sheep herds, I just kind of went through all of our herds, uh, took our population estimates for each of our unit group herds, uh, some of our survey data, and said that we have herds either that are, are approaching or have reached the carrying capacity of the habitat, again, primarily with water development being uh, one, of the, one of the most limiting habitat resources out there on some of these herds, and some even, if they're pr in pr proximity to desert or to domestic sheep, the greater that herd is, the more young rams exist in that herd, and the greater likelihood or probability that you're gonna have more rams wandering. And so I just kind of went down through and looked at what the carrying capacity probably could be or should be versus the population estimate and uh, started summing up how many animals we probably should be removing this year from these herds to keep them in, in check. And uh, some of this data is, is very recent. For example, Tom Donham, I don't know what he's putting in the water in Nye County and Esmeralda County, but he's got herds that continue to um, have tremendous growth rates. We classified, I, in fact, I was in the helicopter, we classified 400 sheep on Lone Mountain. And uh, the estimate last year was only 350. And um, it's, it's the same thing that's happening in the Silver Peaks, neighboring Monte Cristos, um, the Gabs Valley Range near door, uh, nearby, just a, a tremendous growth in those herds. We're a little concerned of the natural springs and the water developments that are dependent on. And we, we certainly not only could use those as source stock, but should use those as source stock. Uh, the Bear Mountains, we, uh, uh, we're in danger. I'm not sure if it's grave danger, but we're in danger of losing some sheep over there. Uh, we had several guzzlers go dry last two years. We actually did a water haul in 2012. And uh, we've actually had some, some very gracious folks that work in the Bear Mountains that have been providing water to that herd. Or I, I think we would have we would have seen some mortalities already. Um, some of these herds do not benefit from the monsoonal rains we've had the last couple years, this is one of them. We, we really need to thin this herd out. Um, we took sheep two years ago out of there, and we definitely have plans to take some sheep out of there this year. It is a herd that most sportsmen know about, a dream of getting a tag, and probably the last thing they want to know is we're going to reduce the herd. But we need to uh, for the greater good of that, of that population. So just another, another critical one is, is the muddies. Um, we, we got uh, pulled out of the fire at the 12th hour by some monsoonal rains, although we may have not skirted some mortalities before we had a lot of limited water, if not dry water, dry guzzlers before the, the, they could recharge from these monsoonal rains we've had in the last three weeks. Um, but, you know, 600 may not be an unrealistic carrying capacity of that 850 we have out there now. Um, so just this year, we, we probably should be moving 450 to 500 sheep somewhere or killing that many to keep, to keep uh, things somewhat reasonable out there on the landscape, both forage, water, and uh, trying to reduce the risk of, of potential interaction with domestics. And it, it ebbs and flows. Um, you know, these, these herds ebbs and, ebb and flow, but we definitely need to look at what 
their highest potential could be, uh, or we can't use that as our, as our population objective. We, we've got to find a, a population level somewhere in the middle and shoot for it and, and keep it in check. So just, uh, so I'm going to go through some, some management actions that we're going to take, um, we hope to take, we hope to get your support to take in the near future. Just some little caveats. Uh, we've got to take a balanced approach. We can't take one extreme or the other. No shoe fits uh, every one of our situation. Uh, there's just a lot of variation within these herds habitat-wise, location-wise, risk-wise. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Um, 11,000 sheep, we're all very proud. Uh, this is something that, you know, it's near and dear to my heart, I'm very passionate about, but we may have, we may need to rethink of, you know, what, what is the realistic numbers that we can have where we have them today. Um, and we really need to, to be very, very careful not to promote bighorn herds that, that cannot be self-sustaining. Um, you know, I, I've even found myself in this trap where I don't want to slow down, I don't want to heed the warnings, um, but if, if we don't, then we're just, we're no, no, no better, no worse than feral horse advocates out there that don't understand the resource, don't understand, can, the carrying capacity, don't understand the risks of properly managing these herds and their numbers. So as I just showed, we, we really need to, not for all of our herds, but for many of them, develop some population objectives with, with as much information as we, we can get um, on those limitations, especially those that are dependent on water development. Uh, and our knowledge of the, the trends of water recharge. Uh, we've got some great folks in our water development program and, and uh, they, they do these calculations daily. Um, and they know what we're, what we're doing and, and unfortunately we're not recharging as well as we used to. Um, and that we do have a couple mountain ranges that uh, our herds are, are definitely um, taking that forage down uh, pretty close to the ground next to those guzzlers. Water halls need to be an absolute last resort. I know in my career, we've over 20 years, we've probably done a dozen. Um, sometimes we don't think much about it. There seemed to be always somebody there to help us financially and physically to do it, but it, it really, long term, it's just, it's really not the, the way to go. We, we can't place ourselves in these, these situations year in, year out, um, and, and, have, and continue to do, do these water hauls. Um, but we have spoke with our, our water development program and our own staff in the game division, and we're not saying that maybe a guzzler here or there that we can drive to that we will not use to increase the carrying capacity of the habitat, but that in a last ditch resort, if we, we don't want to fly over wilderness and dump water, maybe just to keep these animals alive until we can make decisions of whether to capture them and move them, cull them, depopulate them, whatever, uh, waiting for monsoons to hit, maybe something that we can drive to is, is maybe not a bad thing. But again, we can't continue to, to build more and more of these um, in places where we're, we're probably at the top end of the, of the habitat carrying capacity. And we, we've, I'm not, I don't hate water developments. I've built plenty in my day, and they are a very effective, useful tool. Um, but sometimes a good thing can, can be less than a good thing um, when, it's, when it's beyond a point.
we will continue as best we can to augment and reintroduce bighorn into Nevada mountain ranges. Um, we've got uh, some great, a uh, couple great releases slated this fall. Uh, the Candelaria Hills on the border of Mineral and Esmeralda County, uh, which is something that was a uh, result of our, our identification of, of mountain ranges that that we're ready for bighorn releases uh, as long as we did a few things um, and we've accomplished those and there's low risk and we're gonna do it but there's a lot of places we, we, we just don't have that situation anymore and uh, we, we just are running out of options. As I said we're gonna give some sheep to Utah we hope to uh, maybe try to help Arizona out in the next few years But when our herds are not suitable candidates, they have pathogens that we don't want to spread. Um, they're above population objectives. We may not have any other options but to look at depopulating, culling, or in this case, ewe hunts. It's, it's, we really think it needs to be a tool in a toolbox. Um, it's gonna be the last one we would consider but you know we've got we've got herds right now that if they continue to grow, um, Fairview Slate, Sand Springs, they know they have mycoplasma. They're growing lambs, um, defying things that some people think shouldn't be happening. What? But we couldn't, on good conscience, use those as source stock. And they continue to build beyond their availability of the habitat and the waters that we have. We're going to have to do something. Uh, and getting back to these landscape liabilities, these herds uh, combining the, the 750 and the 600, there's, you know, there's 13, 1400 sheep out there that are a risk to our neighboring herds today. We could have these wild sheep, and in fact, we had bighorn that we released on Calico Mountain, Capitol Peak, on the east side of the Santa Roses, two years ago. We put a bunch of GPS satellite collars out. Some of them stayed on the mountain. They read the memo. That's good. Others dispersed down um, the Little Humboldt made contact with the snowstorms, the snowstorm sheep, after they had a die-off. And we documented disease transmission from the snowstorm sheep to the clean sheep that were put on Calico Mountain. They didn't go back home. If we, they did, they would have been dead. But um, we, we need to take that much more serious into the future. And I know I cringed, I know our staff cringed in 2010 when Montana killed over four to 500 bighorns to try to reduce the spread of those disease events in Montana. And we could not do that in Nevada. We tried an alternate management action of, of an antibiotic and a few other things. But I think, I think we really need to consider that uh, is, is an action that we may need to take, especially if some of these herds are very close to an adjacent herd that is clean, that's doing well. Um, and we're gonna be looking at Southern Nevada this fall really hard. We're gonna be sampling the river mountains, adjacent herds. And most of you know who live down here, who've hunted the muddies, how close the rivers are to the muddies. And I'll just leave it at that. That's all I have. Any questions from the commission to Mike? Commissioner Lane. Uh, I, I guess what I'm, you know, still having a problem with is that we've, we've made this major effort to increase the herds um, 
and it seems to me that we you know are just now addressing the carrying capacities uh, mr cox are you saying that the way we deal with this situation in terms of looking at excess numbers either we're going to transport them someplace else or we're going to allow hunters to come in and kill the excess herd is that is that what i'm here is there another are there other options in terms of looking at excess capacity um, that we're now using? As much now, I, I I will tell you that certain times of the day, certain times of the year, I do I do put big hornet on a pedestal. Um, a lot of people do, but at the end of the day, they're just another ungulate. Um, we've restored pronghorn, we've restored elk, we've restored bighorn. Uh, and really, we, we've done such a great job that we, we never wanted to consider harvest, which we, we as biologists, we consider harvest every day. That's, that's, that's part of our job, is provide sportsman opportunity. Um, and so we are at a point where we, we can't continue to use capture and transplant, which is a form of harvest, absolutely a form of harvest, to manage these herds, which has been a great form, a great, great management tool to manage bighorn. And uh, we are at a point, because of these risks, because of pathogens um, and other conditions that, yes, I, I am advocating that in some instances where the other tools in the toolbox, just like we have, I remember years ago when I come to you for pronghorn hunts, it was tough to get them on board. First thing the commissioners asked, have you looked at all options for using those as sore stock for a transplant? And I would say yes. In fact, we've, we're gonna move 200. But at the same time we're moving 200, we need to harvest 300. So, so yes, we, we are no different than Montana, Colorado, Alberta, now New Mexico, who, who have or are looking to get you hunts on the books. Uh, Commissioner Lane. Could, I, I'd like to just have a follow-up question. I guess I'm not, what I'm, I'm trying to understand um, and, and what I don't see is this piece that we've been talking a lot about in the predation management plan. What I don't see in looking at what you've given us, which I think is extremely helpful to look at this issue, is to try to, what I'd like to have is an overlay of predators around those, uh, those herds to try to understand why some of the, you know, because what I, I'm not understanding, I guess, in my, in terms of looking at this is why some areas carrying capacity uh, is, is are, are their uh, reproduction rate is much higher, their recruitment of lambs is much higher than other areas. And clearly water is one of those issues, but I'm, I'm trying to understand where the predator fits in terms of this, of the lamb recruitment. In other words, it, it doesn't, it seems to me we're missing a piece here and and I'm and that's what I'd like to see is because I I know we can we've got some estimate I'm assuming in these areas, and um, have you looked at that issue? Well, the, I just haven't explained it. The piece isn't missing. Um, where where predators can exist, and make a living, with alternative prey populations, they are. Um, so we have lots of bighorn sheep herds that that have lots of lions nearby and coyotes and bobcats. Bobcats kill ewes, coyotes kill ewes, lions kill ewes and lambs. So, um, in fact, I was just talking to someone earlier today that people were up in arms that we had lions, and, and they've been doing this for years, camped on water divans. It's a quite a learned behavior, and they're very good at it. We've got a particular herd that they've been taking their share of bighorn sheep. Um, 
And at first off, as a biologist, because we've, we've done predator control for bighorn, um, I'm an advocate of it. When we take 20 sheep, put them in a huge mountain range, they have not yet understood their escape terrain, uh, their uh, places where they need to go to run away from predators. And it might take a few weeks or months to figure that out. And so we have done some predator control to get a population established. But once they are established, like this herd I was talking to someone about earlier today, um, some mountain lion predation is not a bad thing. Um, we would probably need to be capturing some sheep out of there if it wasn't for the lions. If it got to be too excessive, then we might rethink that, uh, but it is occurring out there on the landscape. But a lot, of, a lot of places, it's too dry for lions to, to be supported. They're very nomadic. Um, there's been a mountain lion in every bighorn herd, hands down, but there hasn't always been excessive predation on bighorn herds. And some, so some have predation that is probably keeping the animals in check and others don't. Commissioner Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to, to uh, commend Mike for his presentation on this issue, and uh, I appreciate your, your candor, honesty, and uh, try to fill in all the information for us to try to understand this. Uh, I think some, some keys that, that where, where I think you guys are heading in the right direction is, is uh, some words that stick out is, is you talked about building trust and communication with the wool growers so that these issues can be addressed in these, in these high risk situations. And also holding the wool growers harmless in these cases. And so I, I, I look forward to the continuation of that practice to help iron out some of these issues. It's definitely a give and take. Um, and hopefully we can have both sides give a little. Commissioner Moran. And just to add to that, there was, a, there was an incident that uh, happened a couple of years ago with, with some exposure to domestic sheep. And uh, I spoke with the department and I spoke with the permittee and, uh, and I got the same answer from both of them. And that answer was that, that we're working together on the issue and, and we will solve the problems. Any other commission comments? Commissioner Lane. Uh, can you tell me what does your veterinarian think about some of these issues have, have I'm sure you all have made done a lot of discussions about this because I got the impression in reading a newspaper article that uh, they're not convinced that you know um, killing a ton of sheep that are sick is really going to solve the problem so I'm I'm assuming that you're talking together and I'm just interested in, in their view on how to deal with this care, the overloaded carrying capacity issue. Um, when, when you say they, other states? Well, I'm talking, yeah, pro I would say veterinarians not only in this state, but also in other states. Um, well, it's, it's kind of two-pronged. Again, we have these herds that have been exposed to pathogens and and the, there has been states that have depopulated or culled some of these herds. Depending on the stage at which the pathogens have found their way into that herd, um, it hasn't always worked. And, and that's why we did that survey uh, a year and a half ago to see, you know, there's things that we can't, we can't know everything, we can't know every pathogen that's causing problems. We don't know when the last exposure was. Uh, we're, we're kind of going on the best available information when there's a disease event going on and uh, wildlife managers are trying to decide, do we let it go? Do we kill three, 400 to save 500? Um, 
and it, it has been a difficult decision for these other states uh, when pathogens are involved, and that is still an unclear situation of, of what will you do when you're there, when it's staring you in the face, and you've got to take action in the next 48 hours uh, one way or the other. Now, when it comes to herds that are, don't have a pathogen problem, they're building um, Montana, Colorado. Uh, they both have conservation strategies that they've developed. They're, they're very uh, detailed management plans. And in each of those documents, they have population objectives for every one of their herds. They're not based on perfect science. It's based on best available. They realize they've got issues next door. They realize they may have water development issues. They may have winter range issues. And they've done their best to say, optimizing bighorn herds is what we're going to do. We're not going to maximize bighorn numbers. So we're going to generate this population objective that we think will optimize. Um, and if we get to that level or they overshoot that population objective, then they will institute ewe hunts uh, with quotas, just as we do, that, that uh, will estimate hunter success and will we get the population down below our objective with a certain amount of harvest. Some of the harvest people want to think that if you keep the population in check, you will reduce the probability of dispersal of young rams, but you're not going to stop a die-off from happening, i.e., four of the five populations that Montana had experienced severe mortality in the 09-10 year, they were already having ewe hunts on. So it's not, it's not this panacea that you know, you keep a population in check, and it's, it's really, it's all about the pathogen. It doesn't matter if you've got 1,000 sheep or 10 sheep. If the pathogen comes in, it's not good. So uh, depends on if you've got a pathogen involved or not, whether you're going to be de trying to depopulate or just manage that herd with limited number of ewe hunts. Any other commission comments? This is informational, so uh, we'll close this agenda item. And uh, it is five minutes to noon. The Predator Management Committee, or whatever we call that thing now, is going to reconvene their meeting. What do you think? 45 minutes? If we give you an hour, if we come back straight up one o'clock, I'd hate to cut you short. So let's go straight one up, one o'clock, come back. We're, we're in recess. <laughs>